What up, everyone? This is Brenton. And Jenna. This podcast is all about connecting with our autumn family in a fun and different kind of way. So turn down that CB, buckle up, and enjoy the show. It's going to be trucking awesome. Welcome, everybody, to the Autumn Transport Podcast. My name is Brenton, and today we have a great conversation lined up for you. We have a couple of our safety experts here at Autumn. Chris and Char are going to be talking to us this week about Operation Brake Safety or Operation Air Brake. And I also have Jenna with me. As always, Jenna, how are you doing? As always, doing good. You are always doing good. Happy that it's Friday. Yeah, absolutely. Any plans for the weekend? Yeah, uh, we're gonna try a water park again, nice and hot uh, this weekend. So we'll go go cool down and let the kids run around a little bit. Well, Sebastian doesn't run, but Everly can run. <laughs> yeah, I saw that it's supposed to be possibly record highs tomorrow in the low nineties, ninety one, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they said the heat index is supposed to be a hundred or higher. Yeah, we're gonna go early, so hopefully it'll be perfect in the morning. So yeah, yeah how about you? I'm sure it'll be great. No, no plans. Nice. For the first time in a while, I've been doing a lot of traveling to campsites and cabins and things like that. What you do in Minnesota in the summer, right? You uh, you go to a, somebody's cabin, you say, ope, and uh, <laughs> boat, and a lot of other funny things in Minnesota. Have a casserole when it's yeah. cold. Don't think I'll be doing that this weekend, but just <laughs> taking things easy. Oh, yeah, you betcha. Oh, yeah, you betcha. <laughs> well, I wanted to bring you, Chris and Char, in to talk to us today about a couple things. Um, like I mentioned before, we do have something coming up next week in the industry. The CVSA has uh, another brake check week for us. So we'll dig into that a little bit and share some things that our drivers need to be heads up on in terms of that coming up. But also wanted to hear from you guys. You were gone last week for a few days up in Brainerd, Minnesota at the Minnesota Trucking Association annual conference. And I wanted to just hear from you what you guys learned, what that was like, maybe um, your experience up there and kind of center our conversation around that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll get started here. Um, so this year's uh, theme. Chris, wait a second. You've been on the podcast before. Yeah. Um, Char has not. Okay. You want so, her to go first? Well, Char, why don't you give us an introduction for the guys listening, oh. just who you are and how you got into safety and your relationship with Senti Transportation <laughs> Services. <laughs> um, hey, it's, it's fun to be here. Um, so I got my start in safety by, uh, being at a truck show that my husband and I help out, um, with in Casson, Minnesota, called the Big Iron, which is coming up here, right? In yep. a couple of weeks. Couple of weeks. Yep. And just remember, this can't be bleep. I got the job. <laughs> My kids listen to this podcast, Char, so <laughs> keep it PG. Um, so I had driven truck for twenty years, um, beforehand, and then um, up at the truck or down at the truck show, uh. I ended up falling into a position working for Chris here at Sunday Transportation Services. So I'm kind of new to the whole safety world. It's been mm, probably 11 months now. So it's been really fun, um, challenging, but super rewarding. And I'm learning so many things. And um, Autumn has definitely been a big help with that. And everybody here is just fantastic. So... Yeah, and then as far as the annual conference, that was that was an experience. Um, my first time there, so that was pretty fun. So you were a truck driver for 20 years, you said, and now you're part of Chris's safety organization, Senti Transportation, and you guys mm -hmm. partner with Autumn to provide us with direction in terms of safety and uh, being the best fleet that we can potentially be. Shar, I think you probably uh, also have the – the market cornered in the office on fingernails and changing color <laughs> and things like that. Right. Am I wrong, Jenna? You're not wrong. <laughs> yeah. So that's, you've added a spark of color as well as bringing your experience and knowledge in the safety industry. So, so Chris, why did you uh, poach Shar to come work for you? So we've actually known each other. We worked together at a company called MME uh, where I was the safety manager 
Uh, so we got to work together. I saw her safety record, uh, how she treated customers, how she interacted with drivers. Uh, and then as she said, uh, we went to the truck show together for many years. She actually started working the truck show two, three years ago, something like that. Something like that, yeah. Uh, so yes, last year she was working the t-shirt booth and I had my booth across and, uh, we were at the truck pull and, I had been looking for help, but not really pushing it. But I said, hey, you want a job? And she called me on that Monday and said, are, are you serious? And, yeah, I, I need help. So uh, knowing her reputation is was a lot of a big part of that because I expect certain things out of my employees that uh, drivers, customers, people come first. And that's the way I want my customers treated. And I'm looking for honesty and dependability. Mm -hmm. So she fit the bill on all of them. So it's been a great time. It's been a good hire for us. And yeah. Well, you mentioned the big iron truck show coming mm -hmm. up. Jenna, I don't know if you knew this, but my dad is a truck driver. <laughs> <laughs> and he has a truck that's going to be down at the big iron. Some of you may have seen it. Some of our listeners may have seen this truck. We put it on our, I snuck it onto our Instagram page. It's a white Peterbilt and he's super excited to get down there and show it off. And so if anybody's there, stop by. His name is Craig <laughs> and he'll be happy to show you his truck. Chris, you've met him down well, there. And that was the, I, I don't know, it was interesting part because I actually knew your dad before I knew you, but I didn't know he was your dad. Right. Uh, because I knew. I don't know names. I know trucks. Yep. And you're like, yeah, this was a truck he had. I'm like, oh, yeah, I've, I've known the guy for years. <laughs> yeah, like, he had that pretty cool Hendrickson that yeah. he brought down there for a couple a couple times. The green Hendrickson. Did oh, you see that one, Oh, I Char? do remember that. Yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah, so when I started here, you're like, oh, yeah, my dad does this show, and here's his truck. I'm like, that's your dad? I'm like, yeah, I know him. <laughs> <laughs> you probably like, were like... Wow, he's a lot cooler than you. But <laughs> so, tell us about. Let's dive into the the MTA conference. What was it all about? What did you guys learn there? So, the title of this year's conference was "Confidence in Chaos," and it dealt a lot with uh, succession of companies. Uh, you know, if it's a family business, what's the handoff line? Uh, how to succeed? So, they did. Why did companies fail? Why do some succeed? Uh, and then a lot of the um, the, the uh, speakers were talking about how to how do you innovate and how do you become successful when there is chaos, whether it be in your company, in the freight or trucking industry, basically in anything. How do you become successful and grow when there is chaos? Well, that's synonymous with trucking. It seems like, isn't it? Chaos, yeah. trucking, and chaos just can go together. Oh, yeah. for sure. Some days you walk out of here with your head spinning, like, "What in the world happened?" Yeah, when I do a value-driven driving seminar, we talk about how fast priorities change because of how fast trucking changes. You could hang up from your dispatcher with one plan, and you start doing it, and all of a sudden you get a call ten minutes later, and that's completely changed because a customer did something, or a truck breaks down, or whatever the situation might be. Yep. We walked through that already this morning with the guys that dispatch for me having to call and say, Hey, sorry, the plan changed. Yeah. It drives them nuts when I do that. I think <laughs> the drivers and the dispatchers, but you, you got to do what's best for your yeah. fleet. Right. Yeah. And respond to the needs of your customer yeah. and take care of everybody in a positive, well-rounded way. Any speakers jump out at you, Shar? things that you heard? You got a lot of notes, so somebody <laughs> must have been saying something good. Um, yeah, uh, the morning session speaker uh, was Stephen Shapiro with um, the Invisible Solutions Institute, and that was kind of an interesting, interesting guy. So uh, the topic was innovation in a time of chaos. Um, so he was more about asking better questions to solve problems. Hmm. So I think Chris has a pretty good example. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one of the things he said is when we're looking to set a goal or uh, looking to have a task that we want to do, are we asking the right questions? 
And I, the line that stuck out for me was, we always have the answers, but we don't necessarily have the right questions. Hmm. So the example he used was, we want more customers. Okay, why do we want more customers? What's the reason behind it? Is it because we want extra capacity or because we want more money? He goes, so you have to answer that question first, why? So he said, if it's just looking to build your revenue, why do you necessarily need more customers? Are there value-added services that you could give your customers and then sit back and actually evaluate your current rates? Are these rates that are five years old and things have changed so much? So actually evaluate your current rates and look for other solutions other than just adding customers for the sake of adding customers, if it's for revenue. Mm -hmm. So that was an interesting way to think about it. It's like, okay, are we asking ourselves the proper questions? Yeah. You get a lot of questions in recruiting, Jenna. So many questions. Are, are potential drivers out there asking the right questions? Oh, they're asking the right questions. Yeah. They're asking all the questions. <laughs> but that's how I learn. Yeah. I'll find out for you. Yeah. And I just admit that I don't know, and that's fine. Usually it works out well for me. So That's a good life lesson for all of us that we learn through asking questions. Yeah. And what I'm hearing you say is you learn a lot about um, your yourself, your company's values, your company's motives, and then taking that into our personal life. As a driver, when you're upset about something that's happened to you that day or you have a goal that you want maybe to add a, a driver to your LLC or um, some revenue number that you think you need to hit, or you're you're mad about what's happened at your company, are you asking the right questions? Why, why am I so upset? Why is this happening? Is there something that might be happening behind the scenes that... I don't know about that could be influencing this situation. Yeah. And like Jenna being a recruiter, I'll guarantee you that the top most asked questions and sure, you can tell me if I'm off a little bit, but is what do you pay? What's your home time? Yeah. That's probably what they ask. What do you do? So where do you go? Advice for a driver that's looking at other companies, you should be asking what's your turnover rate? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, what values does your company have? What, you know, does management get involved in daily activities of dispatch and that? Uh, because you want to dig in more and see what that carrier's like more than just what they pay and what your home time. Yeah. Uh, my big thing is what's your turnover rate? You get, you're going to a carrier with 100% or higher turnover rate, what's your odds of staying? Uh, so I had asked uh, insurance a uh, gentleman had asked me about if you have a driver with 10 jobs in the last two years, what makes you think you're so special that you're going to get him to stay? Okay. Well, it's so easy to chase the dollar because we're motivated by money. We, we need money, right? So money is important. We want our drivers to be able to maximize and make as much money as they can. Mm -hmm. But it seems like in trucking, and I've been here 10 years, Jenny, you've been here a couple, but I guarantee you've probably already seen it, where a guy who, who's doing great, he, he may be one of, even one of our top earners, all of a sudden, all of a sudden does, decides, well, I think I can make more somewhere else. And you said an interesting thing, Jenna, about the number of drivers. You told us at a stand-up meeting recently that we have on our fleet right now that are referrals or people who have come back to Autumn. Yeah. Which is super high. You hear probably from a lot of guys that want to come back to autumn. I think almost half that leave either regret it or end up coming back or like plan to come back. I yeah. mean, it's, I'd have to do research on the actual number, but that's kind of what it seems like. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of the time it's chasing a dollar thinking I'm going to get more money somewhere else. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, for me, I live... 40 miles away from the office. And I actually told somebody uh, within the last two weeks, I said, I wouldn't leave my job if somebody offered me $10,000 more a year because of the culture that's here and the, how much I enjoy it, the way I'm treated, all those questions that I would have that I would answer to what you were saying, Chris, about asking better questions. If I'm a, a driver candidate, what is that company like? Not just about the dollar. Um, 
Yeah, I wouldn't trade ten thousand a year to go somewhere else because of how much I enjoy this place. What yeah. about ten five? <laughs> you ain't like, oh, so sharp. Have to keep going, keep going. <laughs> so sharp. You can speak to it as a driver, and I can also. When it comes to leaving trucking companies, what do you think is a large factor other than money when drivers consider leaving a carrier? We, we dealt with one in specific when we worked together. Um, I had left a carrier um, a few years ago that I had been at for 10 years. Um, I had started working there in hopes to be a lifer, retire from there, but um, the culture around there changed and it wasn't for the better. Um, I left there making a pretty good amount of money and I had four weeks of vacation, but I decided it was time to move on. So I moved on to a different carrier for less pay, but the culture was worth it. So it isn't necessarily always the money, you know. Um, and then, you know, I I may still be driving, um, but, you know, it, ideally I've been looking for um, a safety position anyway because, you know, that's been an interest of mine for years. Um, and I feel like the luckiest person in the world when I, uh, you know, was able to start working for Chris. So... And sometimes yeah. you gotta. Sometimes you do have to explore your options to find that right fit. Yeah. yeah. You know, because as much as I do of Adam and I wouldn't ever want to leave, there might be a better fit for somebody else with a different company. We're not trying to say we're the greatest company ever to exist. Yeah. There's a lot of great trucking companies out there. I think it just thinking through and really coming to a good decision when you make that decision about where what company you want to work for is important. And you've mentioned it twice already, that, that big C word, that culture. You know, that would be another question if I was a driver talking with a possible carriers. What's your culture like? What's the focus of the company? Before we change gears to talk about breaks, is there anything else, Chris, that um, stuck out to you at the conference that you wanted to mention that you think would be beneficial for our drivers to hear about? So... Um, I don't know about driver specific, but carrier specific, they did a round table, uh, with CEOs and one of the CEOs had a paper there with three questions on it. And you had to answer one of the three questions and then put your paper back in the middle of the table. And then she took them together, started passing them around. You weren't allowed to take your own question. You had to answer someone else's. So then you would read the question that you had and you'd give your solution. And then a couple other people might chime in with their solution too. I just thought the premise of that was really nice because sometimes we sit there with a problem and just like, what do I do? I, I, I can't think of anything to do this. I just can't get the wheels turning. Mm -hmm. So why don't you go to somebody else or go to a group of people and go, have you been through something similar or what, what did you do in this case? So, you know, within a company, that would be a good thing to do if several people are having problems, just sit down as a group and do do something to that effect. Uh, well, I suppose a driver could do it with other drivers. Hey, I'm having a couple of problems here. What do you think some solutions would be? Yeah, that falls right in line with what we try to do in the liquid tank division and I, our other divisions here do it as well. If a driver calls in and is having a, a question about usually something mechanical, but it could be a different type of question too. But we'll often say, have you spoken to any other drivers about this? Um, when a new driver comes on at Autumn, we give them the phone numbers right away at two or three drivers in the division who have said, hey, have people call me. I want to help. I want to be a resource to help out those other drivers. And in other situations, if somebody comes in and doesn't have a lot of experience, Jenna and her recruiting team will try to line them up with the driver mentor. And it is a good idea to pool your knowledge, gain, you know, gain in your own life off of the experiences of other people. You yeah. don't have to be out there figuring everything out and doing it all by yourself. It, it doesn't make you any less of a person to ask for help. Yeah. And, and that's a big thing in just life in general with the way society is, the way 
trucking is we can't do it on our own uh, because things change so much. It's a very stressful career. So depending on other people to help or give advice is it's very, uh, very important. Jen, I know you're pretty interested in psychology as kind of a side thing, and you've had to have come across some re- research and reading about just the negative effect of loneliness and isolation. Well, yeah. I mean, that's like one of the biggest topics of psychology because it's so common in humans. I don't have stats like off the top of my head. I only minored in it, minored in it, Brenton. It wasn't my major. Wow. <laughs> so... I do know that if somebody's real bad in prison, what do they do with them? They put them in isolation, right? And that is like a real big punishment because you're stuck all by yourself. And we think a lot of trucking is you're kind of in an isolation chamber. You're stuck in that cab all by yourself. You don't have somebody to talk to during the day, necessarily have fun with. And things have changed. It used to be the CBs. Right. And guys would be on the CB all day long talking to other drivers as they went by and just doing, you know, whatever guys talk and gals talk about on the CB. And now I think there's a lot more people that are just stuck listening to the radio or a podcast and driving by themselves all day without that interaction. Yeah. And when you feel lonely like that, unfortunately, we become our own worst enemy because we're in our own head. And we can make some of these smallest things into large things, or we can become down on ourselves because we are our own worst enemy. So we have to be very careful about what we're thinking about and what we're doing during that time. Yeah, the mind goes to, typically goes to a dark place when we're by ourselves. It takes a lot more energy to encourage yourself and to bring positive thoughts and positive emotions to the forefront. Typically, we start thinking about something negative and it spirals and gets blown out of proportion and becomes even more and more negative. I think the worst thing that happened growing up would be if me and my siblings were were naughty during the day and my mom told my dad that at some point, and then I knew he had the next seven hours of day driving around the city to think about it with all the traffic and the hassle of trucking. Uh, we learned pretty quick that when the truck was turning down the road after a long day, we should probably go to the woods for a few hours, give dad a chance to get out and and relax before he got out and talked to us. Yeah. Well, we have something coming up here next week, August 20th through the 26th is um, the CVSA air brake inspections. And it was interesting to see some of the stats from, safety break day earlier this year. Uh, On April 19th, there was almost 7,000 commercial motor vehicles inspected in Canada, Mexico, and the United States. And almost 12% of those vehicles that were inspected were found with with some major brake issues. And so with, uh, Jenna, how many drivers do we have now? 133? 132? 132. So with 132 owner-operators at Autumn out there on the roads and other people who are listening to this podcast, let's talk about brakes. Yeah, so even not when you're dealing specifically with Brake Safety Week or the inspection blitz, brakes, tires, and lights are the top three out-of-service violations, with brakes usually leading that. Brakes, tires, and lights. Yep, are the top three violations with brakes tending to lead that with out-of-service ratios. Which makes sense because you got to think those are the things. Your lights are on a large majority of the time, so the longer they're on, the more likely things can happen. But brakes, I mean, you're using them every day a lot, yep. and tires too, right? So it makes sense that those things are going to take a beating Yeah, need to be you, kept an eye on. I know that drivers that are listening to this know that the roads in America are so smooth. Oh, perfect. You know, yeah, you, you never encounter some of these potholes that can swallow one of these trucks. So, yeah, they're constantly taking beatings, uh, road debris, uh, overheating, things like that. Uh, and then brakes. Yeah, there's nothing that works more on your truck more than brakes besides the tires. You're constantly using it. That's what you. That's the force that stops that eighty thousand pound truck. So, keeping those well maintained is very important. 
And now that they've gone, you know, have made the movement toward the disc brakes, they have better stopping distances, but they're actually more difficult to inspect hmm. because you can see the backside of the rotor, but you can't just by sight look and see what the thickness of the brake pads are, of the lining. So granted, it's a better thing, but there's a little bit more difficulty in inspecting them. Some of the more common violations with brakes is brake lining thickness, less than a quarter inch in the middle, cracked linings. Uh, improper adjustment, meaning uh, if it's a drum setup, the automatic slack adjuster isn't working automatically, which is a indicative of there being other problems. If the slack adjuster isn't working, either the slack adjuster itself is bad, or there can be a part of the foundation brakes that are faulty. Uh, I was dealing with one driver who his truck looked like it was a show truck, absolutely beautiful, but never greased it. So when we did the truck inspection, I don't know, I think it was about a quarter of his brakes were out of adjustment because he never greased the slack adjuster as well. If it don't get grease, it can't work, so now it's not automatic anymore. Right. Char, you're making eyes like, holy cow, how could he not do that? <laughs> Is this stuff that drivers um, can be checking during their pre- and post-trip? How much of this stuff can a driver be responsible to be inspecting and, and catching ahead of time compared to having to put it in a shop and pull tires off and do a, like a full deep dive. So with inspecting with your pre and post trip, uh, drum brakes especially are fully visible. You can see the S cams, you can see the lining thickness of whether it's cracked or not. You can see the drum, see if there's cracks. Uh, and also when you're checking the drum, you can see if there's other problems that might be arising. So if you look in the drum and it looks like a rainbow, that means it's been heated up too hot. Now that's a problem of, okay, is there a foundation issue or were you just going down a steep grade and depending too much on the brakes? Uh, did you have a super hard stop? So when you start seeing like things like that, that's actually degradation of the equipment. So you're going to want to look at getting that stuff replaced. So with, with the drum brakes, you can see quite a bit of it. Uh, with the uh, disc brakes, you're going to be checking the brake chambers, uh, the air lines, things like that, and you will inspect what you can see from the backside, the rotor. If you see that the rotor is starting to get pitted or if it has the heat, it looks like the rainbow from the heat checking, uh, that's what you'll be able to inspect on those. And the, the inspections that are happening out on the road that uh, the com commercial motor vehicle folks are taking a look at, they're not going to be doing anything that a driver couldn't have done, seen. They're not going to be seeing things that a driver couldn't have seen also. Correct. They don't have special tools that they're, that they're catching violations with that a driver couldn't have known about ahead of time. Visually, you are correct. Uh, but there are special tools that they have. Uh, in fact, me and Char learned about one of them at one of the safety council meetings is they have dynamic brake checking now. It's a little trailer that they tow behind. And when they set it up at a location, they're going to do inspections. They test the performance of your brakes. So it's actually checking how effective a wheel end is at braking. Mm. Uh, so the instance that they had when we learned about it was that the, when they did the level one inspection, everything visually and everything measured out, it was all correct. It was all good. Whereas before, or, you know, under that circumstances, clean level one and away you go. But when they put it on this brake performance testing, one of them actually read well below where it should be. Come to find out that there was a wasp nest in the line. So the Mechanically, it was okay, but the air pressure going to that segment was reduced compared to the others. So it was still functioning, but not to the standard that it should be. So this performance brake testing is a new tool that they have. So it kind of has to keep us more on our toes because that's nothing we can measure. Right. But visually, we can inspect the same things that the officers can. Yeah, I'm looking at a bunch of pictures here, so I was curious if this is the stuff you can't see or 
you know, if this is what you're looking for. But it's kind of reminding me of, like, when I'm re- looking at this metal-to-metal contact picture, it's reminding mm-hmm. me of, like, literally the human body, like arthritis. Like, you've got bone on bone, man. Yeah, exactly. Like, is that kind <laughs> of kind of a good relation, I guess? <laughs> so, Char, being a driver, how many times have you seen a blown-out wheel seal? Oh, uh, quite a few times. Yeah. Yeah. So... When you do an inspection, you use all of your senses. So with a wheel seal leaking, you can actually smell it because you're going to smell that oil. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if it's any type of leak that's been there for a while, it'll actually start to burn when you apply the brakes because an oil will start to burn. You'll smell it. But just the smell of that hub oil, it's very distinct. Uh, Not quite as good smelling as the diesel fuel, but... Uh, it's a very distinct smell. So when you get out and you, you can kind of smell hub oil, I'd be checking your, your mm. wheel seals. Or even if you just got out of the shop, a mechanic can um, inadvertently get grease down there too. They can over grease something and, you know, a blob of it will end up down there on your brake lining and cause issues also. Now I have a question. There's a term I hear, and this is maybe my newbie-ness coming mm. out. What is a Jake break? And is this something you can use to save your brakes or like, what is it? Yes. So I'm going to preface this with, I'm using this word as a uh, technical term. So a Jake brake, Jake brake is actually a manufacturer. The product is what's called an engine brake. Uh, And if you want to look in your history, signs used to put up, uh, cities would put up no Jake breaking signs. Well, Jacobs Electronics took them to court and they won that they were trademark infringing when they put up those signs. So now the signs have to say no engine braking. It's like when people say they're going rollerblading. Rollerblade is the brand. It's actually inline skating. Mm -hmm. Same thing with uh, Kleenex Kleenex, typically and Escalator. Really? Yeah, it's yeah. just become so common that the name of the company becomes the vernacular for the product. Yep. Hmm. So what it is is an engine retarder. It uses the engine, so it uh, retards part of the engine working so that the valves are open. So it uses the power of that compression to slow the vehicle down. And that is especially good when you're mountain driving. So you're going down a mountain, you don't want to be uh, constantly holding your brakes because it's going to heat them up, and then they're going to have what's called brake fade, and you're not going to stop. So using one of these... They're going to go up one of those long, steep runways to (laughs) slow down. Yep. The ski launch you don't want to be on. (laughs) That's right. Um, I saw one picture of one the other day. The guy got to the top of it, uh, one of those, and he goes, well, I guess he won. (laughs) Uh, But when you're going down, the using the engine's own power to slow it down saves you having to use the brakes. So will it always do that? You might have to do an occasional stab brake, which is a hard brake to slow it down, and then it'll regain its, you know, what it's doing. Uh, But it's used as a brake saver, and something that it's actually safety when you're going down a mountainside. Interesting. Uh, it makes a phen- it is a cool sound. I've always loved oh, the yeah. sound. Of- a straight pipe, you know, get a six inch straight pipe in a tunnel. Oh, I love doing that. It's a great. <laughs> it's a great sound. <laughs> yeah. So, but that's nothing that would that it's not really a break. It's that's not something that they're inspecting with this during this. No, blitz. this no. is actually the brake system that's. An engine brake, which is not the same as what they'll be inspecting now. You have an F-150, right, Chris? Yep. Do you have the option to put it into tow mode? Mm-hmm. And that's essentially doing kind of like a, a Jake brake, isn't it? Yeah, it'll, it'll you can kind of feel your engine help the braking of the whatever you're pulling with your pickup. And they actually have those in pickups now, actual engine brakes or exhaust brakes, because they can do it via exhaust, too. Uh make it so that this exhaust is restricted. So then the motor's going, you know, making that sweet sound. Yeah. You got to make uh, sure you know exactly what kind of engine you have, though. Otherwise, you might get the wrong parts for it. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's funny, Jenna. We'll save that for another podcast when we talk about changing your oil. <laughs> All right. So, Chris, um, what what do we? what's the message from your company 
to the the other companies that you advise and to the drivers of autumn as we head into brake safety week I sound like a broken drum, but your pre and post trip inspections are I see what you did vital. there. A broken drum instead of yeah. a broken record. Very good. Yep. <laughs> or a broken rotor. <laughs> uh, it, it's the number one thing you can do to help prevent these violations is doing proper inspections. So when I drove, I would do my inspection and then get driving. But what I would do is I'd want to take more time and do a little more thorough inspection so there might be a time where I'm being unloaded or loaded. So then I'm going to take the opportunity and open the hood and start inspecting brakes, walk around, actually get down on one knee and look under the trailer uh, for these types of violations. Uh, because the more you do that, you're going to catch stuff at the beginning, not after it's all been, uh, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for, but it's going to be a much higher cost to replace this stuff. So in that picture that you saw, Jenna, where that's the, the leaking wheel seal, which is the second picture down, does that look like it's been doing it for a while? Yeah. Yeah. So now, if they can't clean those shoes and the linings, now you have to replace them. Right. So if you catch a wheel seal leaking early enough, you just replace the wheel seal and clean up the leak. But if it's doing it for quite a long time, you end up with it in the brake drum and contaminating your linings. And if you look at the function of a brake, it works on friction. Friction is what stops the vehicle. So if you have oil in there, you don't have any friction to stop the vehicle. So they, they will say that that has reduced the effectiveness of the lining. The other thing that drivers have to be aware of is that one violation can lead to multiple uh, violations in CSA. So you have a leaking wheel seal. Well, did it get into the drums, into the linings? Now you've got contaminated brake linings with grease or oil. Now you've got uh, a wheel end out of service. Once you get more than 20% of wheel ends out of service, the whole vehicle's out of service. So with a five axle vehicle, you're allowed one wheel end out of service. Once you hit the second one, the whole vehicle's out of service. So catching these things early can help prevent you spending a lot more money and less downtime uh, due to having to have additional repairs. Right. I mean, are we talking a quick fix versus a couple days yeah. potentially if there's, you know, you, more issues? Yeah. You're looking at, uh, and I'm pulling numbers out here because there's so many varied costs throughout the country. You could be mm -hmm. looking at $150 wheel seal versus a $900 brake job. Right. Yeah. So... That's Not to mention down part time downtime due to the availability of parts. Yeah. Because brake yeah. parts are an ongoing issue for the last few years, especially where guys are down and maybe they can get a rotor and they can't get pads or they can't get a hub. And then the guy sits for a week waiting yeah. for that part. So that, that'll cost them more money too and lost revenue. Yeah. And then having to either give up a load and, you know, with dispatch, if you go down while you're in the middle of a load, now we look at recovering the load depending on the time frame. So, yeah, it turns into a nightmare. Whereas if we're doing our proper inspections and doing this, then uh, we can catch these problems early enough. The other thing I don't, that drivers should be doing is the brake bleed down test because that will tell you that if your brakes are holding correctly, if you have any broken springs in the parking brakes, things like that. So you, you build the vehicle up to pressure, you turn the key on, you release both brakes, and then you start pumping them down until, one, the buzzer comes on, and then, two, that the valves pop out. And then what you do is start the vehicle and try to drive. It shouldn't go anywhere. But if you start driving, well, you know you've got an issue. And you do that to both the truck and the trailer. So you do it both at first, and then you release the trailer brakes, leave the tractor engaged, and try to drive away. If it starts driving, you've got broken springs. And then vice versa, you release the tractor and leave the trailer on, and if it starts driving away, you know, you've got the broken springs. So if a guy has a question on how to do this bleed-down test, mm -hmm. can they give you a buzz here? and Absolutely. You can talk them through it? 
Anyone listening to this podcast is welcome to call me. My cell phone number is 952-250-6830. No fear. I may have to edit that out, no Chris, fear. and we'll see how the calls go. No, you... Char, you typically send out a weekly safety message to our drivers, just kind of updating them on how we're looking for CSA points, uh, some tips on things to be focused on. We've all been referencing this break safety week uh, tip sheet. Is this something, can you attach this out and send it out to, to the fleet? Yeah, we'll get that sent out to you guys. Yes, definitely. It's also on the CVSA website. So if drivers want to go onto the website, there's a whole bunch of links where they can read about brake checks in the past. They can read reports on how many vehicles have been put out of service. There's a nice little brochure on there to talk about what will happen during an inspe inspection, what things are being looked for, and then this document that Char will get sent out. That's also on there too. So yep. well, lots of ways to get this information out to you guys. Char and Chris are uh, references to you. Give us a call if you have any questions about your breaks, what you need to get looked at. If you want to talk about a Jake break, Jenna is now an expert, so you can call <laughs> recruiting and she'll talk to you all about that. And do you guys have anything else that you wanted to mention? Chris, Char, Jenna? I don't want this noise you're going to hear is me knocking on wood because we <laughs> went through uh, the safety blitz with one clean inspection and no violations. Mm -hmm. So our drivers are doing an awesome job in getting these vehicles in good shape mechanically. And I just want to say thank you for that. Yeah, I think it's an awesome thing to always be prepared. I mean, you know this is coming up, so it's some it's kind of a little bit of an advantage to know about that. I was reading through this article, one quick note. They did an unannounced brake check day back in April too. So we just recently had Minnesota participate in like the speed check and I think they started a day early on us here too. So I mean mm -hmm. it's always a good thing to always be prepared, but great when we have focuses like this too. Yeah. Because we, we can all use good reminders because we, you know, we forget things. Yep. So just these nice reminders, reading through as refreshers, it's always a good thing. Yeah, I have to say I learn a lot from Char's messages. So you might, maybe you're more of a, you can explain things better when you write it out kind of person and that's totally okay. But right. I learn a lot from what you send. So well, thank please you. continue to do that. All right. <laughs> I think I'd like to wrap us up by going back to and kind of tying our two topics together, the MTA conference and the break safety week. And the thing that Chris mentioned at the very beginning was asking better questions and understanding whys. And we had you guys in here to talk about break safety, not just because we only care about having a good CSA score. Obviously, that's important. Obviously, we want our autumn drivers to be able to go into a level one inspection and pass it and have everything on the truck looking good. But it isn't the why behind that isn't just the CSA score. It isn't just to avoid Chris or Shar calling you to ask you why you had a violation. We're talking about people's lives here with brakes. We're talking about 80,000 pound vehicles going down the road at high speeds. And if your brakes, and, that, and that's why they're doing this blitz and this check also, because with the amount of heavy vehicles, big com commercial motor vehicles out there, the chance of loss of life is higher. Yep. Getting hit by a truck can be devastating, not only for the person hit, but for the person driving that truck. And so the why behind this really is to protect life and to make sure that not only do you get your load delivered and get home safe to your family, but everybody else does too. And that's actually part of our road trip, uh, our road test here at Autumn, is when we do the pre-trip inspection portion of it, we ask them the two reasons why you do a pre-trip inspection. And we focus on the safety of people. Not only those around you, but the driver also. The driver could be in the middle of nowhere, and if parts start falling off the truck or something breaks, their life is in danger too. So not only do we preach about the motoring public, but the driver themselves too. Well, thank you guys both for joining us today on the Autumn Transport Podcast. We'll have this safety 
uh, tip sheet also linked in the link tree on our Instagram account. So anybody else that's listening that might not get an email from Char, you can find it on our Instagram account, which is at Autumn Transport. We're also on Facebook and we're on YouTube, all under at Autumn Transport. So make sure you guys go ahead, check those things out, subscribe to the podcast, give us a like, and share it with anyone you think would benefit from this. Have a great day.